narratives are now in completely kind of self-enclosed ecosystems and they never seem to come together. So that sense of like, how can you bring those narratives together? How can you start to create events or processes or dialogues that happen across those divides? And how can we start looking for those figures who are willing to have those? Because that's new. Or everything else is just so played out. And I think when you genuinely see someone doing that and trying to kind of good faith have those conversations, I think it's, I think it's compelling in some way. This is the Other Life Podcast. I am Justin Murphy. This week, we are talking with David Fuller. David Fuller is one of the founders of Rebel Wisdom, which is a very interesting and quite impressive independent media operation. You might have seen some of their videos on YouTube. Um, they're definitely adjacent to us in the space for sure. So I was interested in talking with David because what he's built is really quite striking. He was an independent video journalist for a while, and he was quite successful in that area. But then he eventually decided to go all in with this totally internet-based independent operation. And this is the first time to my knowledge that he really goes into detail about how he did it, the, the underlying story, the decision calculus that was involved in quitting his institutional career and really investing himself into independent media. And he even breaks down the business model and how it works kind of behind the scenes. So there's a lot of interest here for anyone else out there working on their own long-term independent intellectual project and building their own platform on the internet, especially if you're a journalist, especially if, if that's the type of work that you do or the lens through which you think about your work, then I think you'll find this particularly insightful and revealing. So I really enjoy this. I hope you find a lot of interest in it. And one of the things that David is doing with Rebel Wisdom is they're launching some courses. And as you know, IndieThinkers.org has been doing courses. I think this is just it just makes a lot of sense. I think courses are really big right now because people honestly really like them. And there's so much confusion and there's so much there to be done with courses. And so I think it makes a lot of sense. It's a massive space and I'm very happy to you know help him share the word about that. I, I don't think we're really competing. I think this space is, is massive. And I would say his course that's going on right now, it's starting probably right at this time that you're watching this or listening to this. So if you're interested, definitely go check it out. It's called Sense Making 101. And they bring, I think, a different angle, a different, a different style, a different energy to these topics of, of, you know, trying to make sense out of the world today. And I think his courses in particular are going to be especially appealing to you if you take a more kind of self-improvement angle towards it. If you're interested in the spiritual dimensions, if you're interested in things like breathing and relating and this really kind of personal, heartfelt uh, presence. They, they really kind of focus on that style of thinking and interacting. And so if that describes you and that's something that you're interested in and you like to think about the world in, in that way and you want to pursue that and cultivate that, then I think the Sense Making 101 course is going to be great for you. So yeah, go check it out. It's starting right now as we speak. It's not too late to join. And I put a link in the show notes and they've been kind enough to give my audience a discount. So if that sounds good to you, just check the link in the show notes and that will set you up. All right. So that's all I got for now. By way of introduction, I hope you enjoy the show. Oh yeah. I almost forgot. This episode is sponsored by IndieThinkers.org. IndieThinkers is a private membership community dedicated to independent intellectuals, intellectuals working outside of institutions and on the internet instead. So if that describes you, you should check it out. It's just IndieThinkers.org and there's a link in the show notes. You can request an invitation. All right. All right, David, thanks for joining me today. Yeah, really good to see you, Justin. Absolutely. So I'd like to start by, if you would, take us back to when you were an institutional journalist. You were quite successful. You had risen quite high in the ranks. And you had this thriving institutional career as a video journalist before you went independent. So take me back to that time and specifically paint a picture for us about kind of what you were doing, but also specifically what kind of first gave you the idea of going independent and how that, that decision calculus kind of first entered your mind? Mm. You make it sound like it was all very deliberate. <laughs> um, it, it sort of happened very, I mean, the actual transition happened fairly spontaneously. Um, I think it's probably worth going back. I, I trained as a video journalist. So I was at the BBC. I was originally a text journalist writing for BBC News Online. They went through a process in about 2005, 2006 of training lots of people up to use camera equipment, editing, with the idea that everyone would become kind of independent journalists, effectively. Like that was the future of TV journalism, was independent people filming their own stuff, editing their own stuff. And 
it never happened because generally people would go and do this training. They'd be taught how to film their own stories. Like you're going to become a kind of more of a, yeah, more of a kind of independent journalist within the organization. And then they went back into the organization. The organization just beat that out of them very quickly. So people would come back really enthusiastic and they'd just be told, no, no, just go and do the job that you were doing before. Huge institutional resistance. And very, very few of us who went through this training actually ended up doing solo video journalism. I was one of the few who, I, I was pretty good at it. I had a, a good mix of kind of editorial journalistic skills and technical skills, which is relatively rare to start with. There's a, there's a pretty sharp divide in journalism between technical and, and journalism, which we'll get into kind of like how that maps onto the alternative media space maybe in a minute, because it's a really interesting dynamic. But yeah, it, 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 lots of the people who learned that, this kind of great new world, ended up just going back to their old jobs. The BBC still doesn't work that way. I then went to Channel 4 News, which was probably the leading kind of domestic news program in, in the UK after that. I was always, even there, sort of a bit of a square peg in a round hole because I wasn't, I wasn't really a reporter. I wasn't really a cameraman. I wasn't really a, an editor. I could do all of those things. I wasn't really a producer. I had amazing times there. I produced in the Arab Spring. I, had, I was in kind of like the peak moments, I'd say, were kind of being in Tahrir Square when Mubarak resigned in the, in the Arab Spring, being there when, when Tripoli fell with Gaddafi, being in Misrata under fire, kind of when Misrata was completely surrounded by Gaddafi's forces. Like there were, there were amazing moments and I, I really value and I'm grateful for some of those times. Like it was amazing to be in this sort of like I'm in the eye of history moment and, and that was incredible, but there was also this sense of like, I'm not really creatively fulfilled here. I'm kind of being a producer, but I'm not, I'm not, I'm not that organized. So I'm not that brilliant at being a producer. And I don't, I'm not a specialist reporter. I'm not a specialist cameraman. So then in about 2012, I, I quit my staff job and then started making documentaries as a producer director. And producer director is more you, you're, you're, it's basically you and the camera and the reporter. So you're much more kind of independent. And that, that was where I was more satisfied. So I was kind of freelance making documentaries for a few programs like Unreported World um, for the BBC. Uh, sorry, Unreported World for Channel 4, but also a few for the BBC. And then while I was independent, I started doing some more independent things that ended up developing into Rebel Wisdom in about 2018, principally through a, an interview I did with Jordan Peterson, and then turned that into a documentary about Jordan Peterson, and managed to identify and surf the Jordan Peterson wave in 2018, um, of genuinely thinking this thing is gonna go viral and putting all of my chips on it, and then being lucky enough to be, yeah, to, to be rewarded from that, and then kind of moving away from that sole focus on Jordan Peterson and the Jordan Peterson phenomenon to a more sort of intellectual, um, looking at different intellectuals, different ideas. And that's kind of where we're at now, I guess. Okay, excellent. That's fascinating. So when you, there was a push in institutional journalism to train people like you to be independent video producers, was that in some part due to the rising pressure of social media? Was there an awareness oh, wow, there's this rising tide that's going to empower individuals to, you know, make their own media. We should try to harness and capture this. Was that, was that a driving pressure? I don't think so. This was, so this was 2005, 2006. So I think that was before the social media revolution. It was, it was during the reality TV revolution. So it was mostly driven by technology. It was the, the size of camera was starting to shrink the ability to be your own sort of self-starting independent journalist had arrived. Um, but it was more driven by, it was driven by a guy called Michael Rosenblum, who was known as the, the father of reality TV. And he managed to sell the idea to the BBC. Like this is how everyone's gonna be in the future. And the BBC bought it and paid him an awful lot of money to train all of their staff. So it was more, it was more technology driven and in some ways quite far-sighted, but I think what was not appreciated is just 
So a lot of people are now, like if you're an independent media producer, you are probably doing everything yourself. And there, but there are still very few of those people in institutional journalism. And there's this also sort of paradox of the people that, that I know who are still working for Channel 4 News, for example, if, if all you can do is produce and you're dependent on that machine, like you're in a very, you're in a very weak position. Um, like I was in a quite a strong position to be able to strike out and make a career in alternative media. I don't think many people in the old, the old sort of structure of journalism have that opportunity. So you can kind of, there's a lot of fear there and there's a lot of kind of, they're, they're dependent on a structure that they can kind of visibly feel is weakening and, and uh, is becoming less and less viable as time goes by. But I'm, I may be digressing slightly. No, no, that's okay. There's an interesting parallel in academia where in academia, inside of the institutions, there's, a sh there's strong messaging in favor of doing things publicly and on the internet and blogging and podcasting and going on interviews. And, it, you know, they call it impact is, is kind of the buzzword. Uh, so there's strong messaging in favor of doing that kind of thing. And then if you get really good at it, you either will find yourself getting in trouble or if you're really good at it, then you'll find yourself just wanting to quit academia to do that stuff uh, full time. And you're seeing the same thing in other institutions, right? With journalism, you know, you see it with someone gets, if you're a New York Times journalist and you get a little too big, well, then you might as well just start a sub stack and quit New York Times, right? So I think that's an interesting parallel to, to note that dynamic that you, you're observing because you see it, I think, across the board. And that's interesting. So, all right, let's zero in a little bit when you decided to really start shifting your eggs out of the basket of the institutional career and into Rebel Wisdom and your independent projects. I mean, we have a lot of people in my audience who are on the cusp of some kind of decision like this, uh, people who really want to stake out on their own in some creative domain. They want to quit their job or they want to leave their institutional footing, but they're just not quite sure how to think about that. And so it, I think it's really helpful and interesting for my audience to be able to hear inside the mind of someone like you at that time when you're making that 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 decision. What did that look like for you and how did you think about it? So I've also been lucky enough because as I was saying, I've got a fairly unique set of skills. Having worked in the in the kind of institutional media and and have kind of honed my writing skills and my production skills and so having the kind of storytelling narrative skills and then the technical skills as well. I was also lucky enough that that meant I could make corporate films as well. So that has always that was always a a second string. Even when I was doing documentaries, I would get these sort of these projects for crowdfunding films, and um, w was able to to have that as a little bit of a of a cushion. And I, I guess the the thing was to 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 make it to move relatively slowly. Like, what are the projects that you might what what is the place that you might want to get to, and then what are the projects that you can do to show to sort of test the waters. Um, but I'd also say we're all wired differently. Like sometimes some of the, some of the decisions that I've made have been a sort of like leap in the dark into, into a kind of leap of faith. And sometimes they paid off and sometimes they haven't. And I wouldn't necessarily recommend that. But for example, the, the idea, like the Jordan Peterson one that started up Rebel Wisdom, um, that was a bit of a risk. Like I actually, I cashed in my crypto and, and basically funded the first, the first few months of the Rebel Wisdom project were really kind of a, a leap in the dark. We actually were lucky enough to get some funding after that point with um, someone who was very aligned with the, with the project. And we, look, we pretty much targeted that person for funding and they, they, they funded us for a certain amount of the business. And is this and an investor was, you're talking about or a grant or what? It's a private investor. It was a private investor, a sort of philanthropic private investor who was very aligned with the project. He's got very similar projects that he's aligned with. So I'd, I'd give that as a bit of advice as well, especially if you're looking to do something that's got kind of um, a kind of, what would you say, a sort of beneficial impact or a, um, if, if what you're doing is, if your passion project and most people's passion projects are in some ways aligned with greater values in, in some way. Like we, we really want, like Rebel Wisdom is about, there's many things it's about, but one of them is how can we have conversations that don't degenerate? How can we deal with the fragmented in, in information ecology? Many of these deeper questions, there are lots of people who are really interested in that. And I guess finding, 
finding who those people are and then potentially putting a proposal together. Like we have one particular person in mind, we put a very specific proposal together and they were very receptive to that uh, right at the beginning. So that was, but, it, but I think energetically having kind of doubled down and, and made that sort of leap into I want this to be a success or just putting all of my energy behind that. I think, I think you have to commit. There's, a, there's that wonderful Goethe quote about um, when there is boldness. Boldness has magic in it. And there is a sort of sense that, I mean, I also Rebel Wisdom has a kind of spiritual side as well. Like I genuinely believe that like intentions matter and setting intentions matter and making that kind of internal leap into, um, yeah, the universe starts to reward you if it knows you're serious about something. Yeah. I know exactly what you mean. I think there's there's some truth to that. I think it's it's also not just spiritual necessarily. I think there's a real physiological explanation for that yeah. as well. It's just like when your when your life depends on something more, you know, you have to uh, follow your 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 whole body is kind of motivated to follow through on it uh, more aggressively. So yeah, I, yeah, I don't like the word spiritual because it sort of says spiritual is this thing over here. I think it's actually a a word for a dimension of existence that it can be expressed in many different ways. Right, right, um, totally. Yeah, no, I, I think the different ways of explaining it and, and different uh, kind of causal factors, whether they're spiritual or, um, you know, psychological and physiological. I, I can well, testify to it myself as well. People around you who recognize this guy really means it, means it I'm going to, like, and then people are more willing to support you in whatever that endeavor is, if you've made that internal shift. That's right. Okay, fascinating. So this early supporter, it sounds like it's basically a, like a private gift. It wasn't an investment. Uh, it was it was in exchange for a certain amount of the company. Oh, okay. So you so you have so Rebel Wisdom has like a cap table. You have you have uh, investors who own different shares of it. Is it just one other person yeah. other than you and Alexander? Uh, yes. So there's three of us who own who own parts of the business. Okay, fascinating. So it sounds like Rebel Wisdom really kind of kicked off on the the Jordan Peterson wave. So that's kind of interesting. I, I want to hear a little bit more about that. Is it like you encountered this guy, Jordan Peterson, you were like, wow, this guy is going to the moon. If we make some videos about this guy, we're going to go to the moon. Let's go. Was that basically the logic or could you, could you give us some more detail? I find that quite fascinating. Um, yeah, like I say, it was kind of an accident. I, I was absolutely fascinated by Jordan Peterson when I found him in, in I think summer 2017. And I've always been interested in the kind of the paradox of like what can be said in, in media. As I said, I've got a kind of, I've, I've all, always done a lot of sort of personal growth work. I've spent a lot of time around kind of spirituality, awakening, all of those kind of ideas and always found the kind of mainstream media conversation around to be very sort of materialist and narrow and kind of dominated by a kind of new atheist hegemony, which I think is starting to shift now. There's a kind of openness to panpsychism and a few other kind of other ways of looking at the world. But at that point, this sense of like the new atheist hegemony and kind of cynicism being paramount. When I saw Jordan Peterson, I just thought, wow, this guy's taking them on on their own turf. And I saw this shift online between kind of the Sam Harris fans of like laughing at anyone who took kind of religion or uh, myth seriously to people saying, if you don't take this stuff seriously, then you're, you're the idiot. You're the one who's uh, rejecting all of this kind of deep evolutionary history, et cetera, et cetera. Like Jordan Peterson was presenting myth and religion in a way that kind of was, was seemed to be in tune with evolutionary history and with a sort of deeper sort of a, a narrative that seemed in tune with science, at least from, from my perspective, and a very complete worldview. That was what attracted me to him. And I was like, this guy's got a very well worked out kind of perspective. And it wasn't the culture war stuff at all that attracted me. Um, back at that point, it was, it was just this sense of like, he's really articulating for me some really deep truths about um, the way we've evolved and the deep stories that we live by and, and, and that sort of stuff that was incredibly attractive. And I just thought, this is, this is the message we need right now. And I think it's going to go, it's going to be huge. And so I actually, I, I booked to go and see him in Toronto for one of his Bible lectures. And then I thought, well, I'm a, I'm a journalist. I might be able to get an interview with him. Got the interview with him, did it while I was over there, and then thought, well, no one's done a documentary about him yet. I'll make it into a documentary. And it pretty much came from there. 
and then a follow-up documentary called Glitch in the Matrix. So <laughs> this is where it gets a tiny bit weird. Um, so on, what I was mostly talking about with Jordan Peterson was synchronicity. Jung's concept of synchronicity, what we were just talking about, kind of things that, strange coincidences that seem to have a deeper meaning. I, I knew that would happen or that some kind of, that was spooky in some way. Um, and we talked, that's mostly what our interview was about. And then he, uh, two days after I released my first documentary with him, he rockets to fame on Channel 4 News with the interview with Kathy Newman, who I was working with as a freelancer only a few weeks before. And so I was like, that's kind of weird. And so I made a documentary off the back of that saying, this is kind of weird, and I think this is a multi-layered multi -layered kind of encounter, which is why it became such a viral sensation. It shows up the, the issues between like alternative media and mainstream media. It shows how that you've got the gender dynamic. You've got all of these different kind of levels of meaning in that one encounter, which is why it kind of had the resonance that it did. And so I made a documentary about that encounter, pulling apart all of these different levels of, of meaning. And one of them was the alternative versus the mainstream. The mainstream has got this kind of facsimile of truth seeking, like, which was completely epitomized in Kathy Newman's like pseudo interview. So what you're saying is coming up against this kind of other truth seeking modality that had kind of was coming to, to self-awareness in a way, long form podcasting, really listening to people, trying to understand where they're coming from. And you had this incredible juxtaposition that just exploded. Um, so yeah, I made the, the documentary Glitch in the Matrix that is still the most popular film that Rebel Wisdom has put out. Jordan Peterson uploaded it to his channel. It got 5 million views. Um, still the third most popular film on his own channel. Uh, and then followed up with a few films about the Jordan Peterson phenomenon, including some criticisms of, of Peterson as well. I'm a, I'm a journalist and I take seriously, I, I really take seriously, like I don't want to be just a puff channel for different, for different people. I want to kind of interrogate, I want to try and find truth. Um, there are complexities there because you're also in a fragile position in the alternative ecosystem because you have to manage relationships. You have to, like, you can't, you can't just go in and get a reputation as the guy who asks all the difficult questions and know that you're never going to get interviews again. And so there's all of these like deeper kind of ethical questions that come up within this that I, I wrestle with a lot. Um, I've just, I've just, so basically the, the question you asked was, was how did we get to the point where Rebel Wisdom was, and now we are self-sustainable. We weren't for, for, for a couple of years, but now we are through the courses that we're doing, through a membership model, and that's been, that's been quite extraordinary to get to that point. That was our kind of original business plan, but I don't know if I actually ever believed that we get to that point. Uh, but we did. And then, but it has felt like it hasn't, yeah, I guess it was a plan from the moment we put the business plan together. But um, it, there's a lot of kind of happenstance and coincidence. And I certainly wouldn't say it was kind of, it certainly wasn't planned out from the moment I saw Jordan Peterson that that would be, the beginnings of a, of a kind of media learning platform. It, it happened very sort of naturally after that point of just, and, and I guess that's, a, that's another skill. It's like we value kind of setting intention and getting there, but also responding in the moment to what, to what works, I think is probably more important than, than having said, yeah, I, I conceived this business five years ago and now I've got here. Right, right. So when you first started Rebel Wisdom, then did you all, did you have a job as well? Or when did you quit your job in the institutions? And how did you think about doing that? Well, I quit my staff job with Channel 4 News in 2012, and was doing documentaries. So almost everyone in the TV industry is on co short term contracts. So I was taking short term contracts for 10 weeks at a time, 12 weeks at a time, 16 weeks at a time doing documentaries. So it was more a case of being able to say no to those contracts than actually sort of leaving a staff position, which I'd done back in, in 2012. Okay, and Rebel Wisdom started what year? 2018. Right, okay. So you get all this amazing traction early on with your Jordan Peterson videos. And then over time, as you alluded to, you've built out this whole little empire under the rebel wisdom banner. 
I would love if you would to just break down that empire a little bit. What are the key moving parts? And I know you didn't plan this necessarily, you know, uh, from the beginning. It's evolved. But what is currently the the business model? How, how would you characterize it? So the business model is it, it's driven by the um, by the the editorial in terms of like I think that's the the bit where we're we're trying and failing and doing different things. Um, we have so Rebel Wisdom is two people. It's me and my co-founder Alexander Biner, and Ali is so he also does a lot of the the content as well. He takes a real interest in psychedelics and is sort of looking at the the corporate capture of psychedelics and kind of trying to do real original journalism around that. Um, and that's all going to the YouTube? Is the YouTube the focus of the journalistic output? Yes. Yeah, we've also got a newsletter. We've got a, um, we do a little bit of stuff on Medium as well, some written content, but by and large, most of it is, is on YouTube. And real quick, David, you alluded before to kind of feature length documentaries. Is that right? And the, yes. th those are all YouTube also. Do you have any other distribution when it comes to films? Or when you say documentary, you're, you're releasing everything YouTube only? Everything's been YouTube only. Um, the, the feature documentaries, I mean, I wouldn't describe, but not many of the pieces that we put out I would describe as actual documentaries. They're mostly interviews with some longer kind of hybrid documentary style films. Glitch in the Matrix is probably the most documentary style film but I'll I'll commission graphics I'll um, kind of mash different kind of interviews together and produce something that's kind of midway between a documentary and and a kind of YouTube film so I think I've got I think our content is quite high end for YouTube but quite low end for kind of mainstream TV but but the the, the wonderful thing about that is that I know from documentaries that there's so much waste in that process there's so much there's so much cost involved, there's so many people involved, there's so much time taken to do everything that that's the main reason. I've thought about what would happen if someone offered me like a real, a, an opportunity to do a, a, a series on the BBC or something based on similar ideas and I don't know what I'd say to it because just the, the amount, the turnaround time for something like that relative to, to what I'm able to do on YouTube is, is totally different. And it's, it, yeah, I, I, I'd struggle with that. I, no one's asked me yet, so I've not had to make that decision, but I do ask myself. Okay, interesting. So I kind of interrupted you. I just wanted to clarify. So YouTube is the dominant, sounds like perhaps the only, the main way that you publish content, mostly video. And then we, on we the also back have end. A, we turn everything into a podcast as well. So, okay. so people can, can also hear it on, yeah, wherever you get your podcasts, as they say. And the, and the Rebel Wisdom pos, podcast, is that what it's called? It's, is it just the audio from the videos? Yes. Okay. Yeah, it's the audio from the videos. But a lot of people prefer, prefer listening to it that way. Okay, right. There's, so there's not much, you're not publishing much via blog or newsletter. That's not a major aspect of? Yeah, newsletter we're now doing every two weeks. And, okay, yeah, that's new. Are watching this, we're putting quite a bit of resource into that. Um, we've got a, a, a researcher writer who's quite extraordinary. We give him a brief and he spends a couple of days putting something together. Um, that's actually been phenomenal. We launched it six weeks ago and we've done three and they've been really, really high quality. We're getting a lot of good feedback on that. So the newsletter also, I guess, it summarizes what a lot of other people are up to in, in this sort of the wider space. Um, people who we've had on, our, on as interviews, people are kind of asking similar questions. So we want it to be like a resource that brings together a lot of different uh, people from, from similar backgrounds. Okay, very cool. So it sounds like video, podcast, and now newsletter are the main kind of public-facing content mm -hmm. outlets. And then on, on the back end, what, what else is the rest of the business model? So the rest of the business model is we have a membership. So we do two, three, four, sometimes live events a week that are kind of drop in to, to members. There's three different membership levels, $5 a month, $10 a month, and $25 a month. And you get differing levels of access and kind of member-only films and the, the sort of standard, standard kind of Patreon offers. And then the courses 
um, are also kind of a big part of the business now, developed into a big part of the business. We run one called Sense Making 101, which again brings, we've got um, Daniel Schmachtenberger, John Bavaki, uh, Diane Marshall Hamilton, and Doshin Roshi as guest faculty who come in and do some of the work. And, and then, I mean, Sense Making 101, a, a big part of our focus is like, how do you make sense of the world? given that academia is broken, given that journalism is broken, and also that we're so kind of manipulated and hijacked all the time by the social media and by kind of all of these forces of kind of weaponized technology, it has to involve some kind of self-development angle. It has to involve mindfulness. It has to be Im involved kind of reflecting on how we're being manipulated, how we're being triggered. And so that's what that course is, is around. And what I think... I listen to Sam Harris quite a bit, and he, he muses quite a lot on different business models, and I found him really interesting and really useful to listen to. He talks about, for example, you have to do something that's congruent with your message. And he says, for him, ads would not work, whereas for someone like Tim Ferriss, ads work because Tim Ferriss's brand is all about what's the best stuff out there, I'm using this. And I think, for us, ads wouldn't work. Um, but courses of kind of, because of what we're talking about on the channel, it very much works to say, well, we've talked about some of these skills of awareness, of emergent dialogue, of all these different things, and then we've, we've brought these experts in to teach you some of these things. So I think, I think that, yeah, I, I've got quite a keen sense for what feels kind of congruent and what doesn't. And I think, I think if you make decisions that are not congruent at, at some level, then it probably will come back to bite you um, at some, somewhere along the line. Yeah, totally makes sense. How many people do you employ? You referred to an employee before. I'm just curious how many people total on the team? Um, so we have three or four, we have no full-time freelancers. These are, these are sort of two days a week, three days a week, four days a week. Um, I think three people in total who we're kind of like in, in, employing semi-regularly, uh, and then me and Alexander are the, are the full-time kind of powerhouses of the, of the business. Yeah, absolutely. Okay, fascinating. So maybe you could also give us, a, give us some sense of Rebel Wisdom scale, if you would. It's quite an impressive project. I know on YouTube you have somewhere around 200,000 subscribers, but when you, when you kind of look at the, the, larger, the larger system, I'm curious, how do you think about scale and and size and growth and metrics and these these types of questions because you know people like us were you know we're obviously primarily motivated by the ideas the content and this this kind of mad search for for the truth for freedom for liberation whatever you want to call it but we run businesses as well and i think i'm just always curious to learn how you think about that because there's there are many ways of thinking about it where you just kind of get lost in the metrics and all of a sudden you're obsessed with just making some numbers go up and it becomes it becomes quite it becomes quite it can become quite terrible i mean i i found myself in that in that state of mind frequently sometimes i fall into it um and so i'm, I'm always curious to learn from from people like you how you think about the numbers what numbers are you paying attention to what numbers are you trying to increase and um how you define metrics and growth for you? Mm. Yeah, it's a very complex question because I think that th there's another level of kind of ethical... I, I think coming in, I, I often have these conversations with other kind of independent producers who 90%, in fact, I, I can't think of that many other people who, who've come from a kind of mainstream media background and are doing this in the same way. Like most of the conversations I have with other producers are kind of often me reflecting on kind of my inherited ethical background or sense of kind of what, what journalistic values are and how I kind of apply them to this area and, and often them maybe kind of re yeah, reflecting on kind of like reflecting on thinking they don't think in that way most of the time. Um, like, I, for example, if I was only thinking about the metrics of subscribers, if I just carried on putting out anti-woke content all the time, I know how to raise, I know, I know how to play that game. And I've seen other people do it really well. And the, the, the concern around having, having followed the intellectual dark web conversation quite closely, 
and just seeing the effects of audience capture, the effects of the inability to kind of admit, admit that you were wrong in public, the aligned incentives that come in with any project like that. Like that for me is a morality tale for our age, which was beautifully illustrated in the set of films by the guy Timber on Toast about Dave Rubin. I don't know if you've seen those. No, I haven't. You have to watch it. It's a, it's a morality Timber on tale Toast. Our times. Yeah, Timber. He, he spent God knows how many months putting together like the, the, the arc of Dave Rubin's career from kind of genuine disaffected liberal to audience capture to kind of whatever Dave Rubin is now. Um, and, and it's a morality tale for our times. And I think I did an interesting interview with Jay Shapiro, who uh, made Islam and the Future of Tolerance with Sam Harris. He's kind of a, just on the fringes of that same conversation. Really interesting guy. Um, and he was saying, look, OK, we're all critical of, of Dave Rubin, but we should really see him as a morality tale. We should say there, but for the grace of God, go any of us in the alternative media universe. Because you start pursuing certain clicks, you, start, you, you, you get warped by your audience, especially if you've got a Patreon. That's often a filter for like the most passionate people. And so I'm sure, like I feel lucky that I, I know that our, our membership is a moderating force rather than, extru rather than a, a, an extrematizing force, whatever the word, radicalizing force. Because the, the comment thread under our videos is insane. Like a lot of the time the comments thread is pretty insane. And it's like, especially if you do stuff about vaccines or you do stuff about any of these kind of hot button cultural topics, it's like there's a lot of... There's a lot of um, triggered people on YouTube. Um, and I, I'd, be, I'd be wrong if I said that never had any impact, but, but I try, yeah. I, so the metrics, the metrics that I care about, obviously, now we are um, self-sustaining, are, the, are the, the metrics for the, the, the things that are making us the money, the, the memberships and the courses and kind of giving people what they want and, and trying to give a, yeah, trying to get enough people onto those that, that we can continue to grow and continue, continue to develop products. Those are the metrics that matter the most. Um, but I also, it, I also keep an eye on how many subscribers we've, we've got. Um, and I think that kind of reflects, that reflects kind of the clarity of the editorial that we're putting out. And I think sometimes it's not as clear as it could be because I think we, we make topics about so many different things that I'm not entirely sure that People know, I think people who watch us closely know what a Rebel Wisdom film is, but I'm not sure everyone else does. Like, I think there could be more definition and more clarity in terms of the, the editorial offering. Right. Okay. Interesting. I mean, you're so right about, it's an interesting point you make about when, if you're, do, if you're operating in our spaces, it's very, very tempting to, you can just go all in on just anti-woke drivel and you can grow much faster. I mean, it, I think, I think you alluded to this and it's it's pretty it's pretty obvious actually when you look at some of the people that are growing really fast and and even when you look at your own metrics uh, on something like YouTube or Twitter also I think just as well it's like you learn pretty quickly in this game <laughs> that if you if you're willing to just lower your standards and just repeat ad nauseum the stuff that's really hot button you you do grow faster for sure without a doubt and and it's and it's it's really tempting it's it's actually very hard to to not do it. I mean, I'm pretty good at, I'd like to think I'm pretty good at not doing it. Um, but then I think all the time, like, man, should I do it more? Because I'm not growing as fast as I could. I know that I could be growing faster if I just basically did like 20 more tweets each day saying the same kind of like hot button drivel, which is easy to turn out. Like maybe I should be doing it. Why am I not doing it? Um, and so it, it, it's very fascinating. It's, it's for people who are not in this game. It's like, it's more of a weird puzzle than, than people sometimes appreciate yeah, yeah, and I feel lucky that, yeah, I've got peers who, who I can kind of talk these things through and can reflect back, and they're having sort of similar, similar dilemmas. But I, I was going to, you reminded me, you, you know, must know Venkatesh Rao, the Internet of Beefs. Yeah, I don't know him personally, but I do know of him, sure. Yeah, he wrote a beautiful piece called The Internet of Beefs, which just outlines that incentive structure of social media, how he said all all social spaces are being taken over by beef-only thinkers. 
either you agree with them or you're in a state of warfare, and that's it. And there's the, night, the game of knights and mooks. You're, you're kind of celebrity knights followed by an army of mooks. And it's totally, terrifying. Totally. You, you see people like you see people who master that game doing incredibly well, and then boasting about how many followers they have on Twitter. It's like fair play. But right. Okay. So anything. interesting. So it sounds basically like you don't have any hard and fast rules, but you just basically try to be holistic about it. And you obviously want to keep growing revenue, and you are trying to do that. And you want to keep growing subscribers, and you you want to keep doing that. But you also just try to follow, I guess, your own internal compass about about what's true and what's what's worth seeking and what's not it, it sounds like is that kind of your answer that there's no uh you, you haven't discovered any any particularly you know a powerful heuristic but other than just kind of following your own compass and trying to balance them yeah i guess we're trying to see whether there's a market for nuance um and i think i think there is i think there's a lot of it's kind of the exhausted middle just the sense of there being an exhausted middle and that people want to and people want to hear all, all sides of the story as much as they can. And this is where I feel that we're going to next in terms of the fragmentation of the information landscape, especially under COVID. I think a lot of people find it quite scary because they just can't find, um, yeah, they can't find the truth. And they, they, they see certain truths, just ne this sense that now... <laughs> Narratives are now in completely kind of self-enclosed ecosystems and they never seem to come together. So that sense of like, how can you bring those narratives together? How can you start to create events or processes or dialogues that happen across those divides? And how can we start looking for those figures who are willing to have those? That I think is, I think people are, want that. People want to, because that's new. or Everything else is just so played out. And I think when you genuinely see someone doing that and trying to kind of good faith have those conversations, I think it's I think it's compelling in some way. Yeah, I completely agree. I mean, I'm I'm finding that I I do I do believe it's sustainable. I do think there's a real market for nuance and sophistication. I think that the main problem we face that others don't face as as much is simply the, the growth problem, the 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 content growth. It's just so much easier to grow your content and your following when you're willing to basically be a repetitive on the stuff that's really hot and b when you're when you're willing to just pour kind of the gasoline of of culture war on onto it and so i hate repetition i i i hate when i see people that are just like churning out the same talking points because it because it gets retweets or it gets you know subscribers i i find that just kind of um I, I, there's just something in my constitution that does not allow me to 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 descend to like shameless constant churning and repetition of the same talking points, and uh, I and I think it's a real it's a real um, inhibitor when it comes to growth because that that is part of how you grow fast I think, and but but nonetheless I mean I think you can grow enough to have a, a financially sustainable operation like I have now and like you have now so I mean you know we probably could both grow faster if we wanted to lower our standards or change our style. But uh, the more important thing is that, you know, we can be, you know, we can succeed and at least be financially viable and sustainable and hopefully quite successful, maybe less successful than we would be if we were, you know, sold, sold our souls. But um, the fact that we can do it we can sleep at all. At night. <laughs> what's that? But we can sleep at night. Yeah, yeah. And I think the fact that we can do it all is the, is the, is the most amazing thing in, in my view. What I want to ask you next is, you know, for people like you and I who run media operations that are largely about kind of outsiders and indie thinkers, there's a problem that I think all people like you and I face. And I just want to get your your perspective on it, which is this question of how to draw lines about how 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 outside is too outside is one way to put it. Or, you know, when does provocative become harmful or dangerous? You know, I think no matter how kind of free speech absolutist you are, at, we all at some point necessarily draw certain lines around who we consider, you know, worth paying attention to within our own media. And I'm just very curious to know, David, from, from your personal perspective, if you have any heuristics for how you draw those lines and who or what kinds of ideas you consider, you know, provocative and perhaps dangerous, but you're willing to entertain and you're willing to spotlight and those which you're not willing to. How do you think about that? Yeah, it's a, it's a great question. And it's something I think about a lot. I mean, I'm not a free speech absolutist. I find, 
I, I've, I've toyed with actually putting out a film saying I'm not a free speech absolutist. Or, uh, what I find astonishing is how much ideology there is around this on YouTube. Like, it's such a fixed ideology. It's, and, and people will, if you say anything that sounds like you're not a free speech ideologist, people in the comments will be like, oh, you don't understand. Who, who gets to decide censorship is wrong and bad idea, good ideas put out bad ideas? It's like, how do you know? How do you know when the bad ideas are more sticky and more easily easy to hijack? Like you don't, that's, a, that's a statement of faith that I don't think is, is borne out by, by reality. Um, so I, I think about this a lot in terms of, let, let's take an example right now. So right now, I, there's a lot of discussion around the vaccines, a lot of discussion around kind of hydroxychloroquine. You've got this sense that, well, YouTube and some of the other tech platforms have actually been censoring some of the discussion around this topic. For me, this is, this is a symptom rather than a cause. The, and the, the, the cause is what I've called, and we, I call in the, in the latest newsletter we just put out, the uncanny valley between the mainstream and the alternative. On one side, you've got the mainstream basically gatekeeping out anything that's counter-narrative, counter-consensus. And by doing that, they're obviously gatekeeping out, gatekeeping out all of the new ideas and all of the heterodox ideas that are needed to kind of reinvent the structure. So it's, that's, that's the thing that I think a lot of the people in the IDW were focused on, rightly in some ways. But then on the other side, you've got this incentive landscape in alternative media that means that these alternative heterodox fringe figures are not challenged. Like a lot of these people will turn up on podcasts and talk about, say, the danger of the vaccines or whatever, and there's no incentive structure on these alternative platforms to, to, to challenge them. They either don't have the ability or they, yeah, they, so what you've got is this valley of truth seeking where, and it's too late to put the genie back in the bottle. You've got the mainstream still trying to gatekeep the conversation and say, well, we're not going to platform this person. We're not going to have them dialogue with a scientist because that's false equivalence and it gives them too much prominence. And it's like, well, it's too late. That game doesn't work anymore. So how do we, how do we bridge this gap of responding to some of these claims on, on the alternative, some of which might be true, some of which are, are likely false? And I, I don't see anywhere where these narratives are coming together. So I had um, the guy Zubin Damania, Z Dog MD, who's a kind of celebrity doctor on a couple of days ago, and, I, and we talked exactly about this, about the sort of fragmentation of the information landscape. And I don't know any easy solutions to it, but I do think that we have to find a, pl a place where people from differing perspectives can come together and actually have a good faith conversation. Because on the other side, you've got this sort of sense of um, the only reason someone might disagree with me is they're captured or they're, or they're somehow financially influenced. Like We've lost the ability to, to realize that people can disagree on the evidence in good faith. Um, that's a, a long way around saying, like, who do I think is worth having on and who not? Um, and how do I make that decision? It's a personal decision. I think I've got a bit more freedom because I don't have a huge amount, a huge audience. I think the, at the moment, like I wouldn't have Stefan Molyneux on, for example. Um, I know other people in the space have had him on. Like he always gave me the creeps. Um, and yeah, the more I found out about him, the more I just felt like he was a wrong one. Um, so that's a personal judgment. Um, generally speaking, but I, but I, perhaps I think having someone like Mike Cernovich on actually, I might be interested in that. Like he's, he's a complex character and actually says some interesting stuff. And I think it could be a, like he, I think, I think he is defensible. Um, but but you, but for me, part of the thing, it's not whether you have someone on; it's how you treat them when you have them on. Why are you doing it? How are you doing it? How are you framing that interview? If you watch the Timber on Toast series about Dave Rubin. What becomes clear is it's not, it's not that Dave Rubin has on lots of people who, are, um, who have unpalatable views. It's that Dave Rubin systematically frames them as being allies, avoids asking them any difficult questions or even putting some of their previous statements to them to defend, 
and frames them in a certain way that is essentially dishonest as kind of allies against the, against the woke left. And he does it systematically and deliberately while hiding behind the argument that, oh, I'm, I'm not, um, I don't do interviews like that. I just let people, give, I give them enough rope and they hang themselves. It's like, no, you don't. That's not true. So, so I, think, I think you can defend having anyone on as long as you do the interview in a responsible way. And that, that is a kind of obsession of mine is that I don't think there's a skill level within alternative media for people who know how to do that in a way that doesn't, because the other problem is that, that that whole modality has become performative in the mainstream. Like mainstream journalists are mostly, when they're doing interviews with reprehensible figures, are signaling to their journalist friends that they're still on the right side of history. They are taking things out of context. They are like, it's broken on that side. And I think a lot of people, a lot of viewers are aware of like, they're seeing the holes in the mainstream consensus and saying, hang on, there's something going on here. But with, this is the concern, we're throwing the baby out with the bathwater because we're losing any sense of kind of, we're losing any sense of kind of responsible truth seeking alongside the loss of the kind of institutional media. And that's, the, that's part of this sort of uncanny valley that I, that I talked about. That's, that's the thing that I'm most obsessed by, I think, is this sense of how can we bridge the gap between a failing mainstream and a failing alternative because of the incentive structures. And I don't know the answer to that, but I, but I think that's the most interesting conversation we can have in the media space. Yeah, I think that's a that's an interesting diagnosis of the problem. It makes a lot of sense. And you you mentioned Dave Rubin as a kind of case study of how internet incentives can make of oneself a kind of this kind of airbrushed culture war caricature of oneself over time. And I like thinking through case studies. I think there are a lot of interesting case studies when when you look at the different individuals who have had different careers and trajectories in the kind of independent creator economy. There's there's an interesting case actually, which I learned a little bit about through you. Totally different kind of example of something very different, but um, this is a little random. I wonder if you could tell us a little bit about the Brian Rose situation. I know you covered this a little bit. I didn't follow it closely enough to actually understand the story, but it seems pretty weird and interesting. Could you give us a quick recap of, of what happened with that Brian Rose guy? And like, what's the story there? Sure, sure. I'll, I'll do the abridged version as much as I can. <laughs> Um, so Brian Rose is the co-founder of London Real. London Real, which was a podcast sort of built in the image of Joe Ro the Joe Rogan experience probably 10 years ago. And he originally co-founded it with a um, mixed martial artist, jiu-jitsu guy who could have kind of brought that brand, that kind of um, Joe Rogan style kind of ethos to the project. Fairly soon afterwards, Brian Rose kicked him out and then built London Real in his image. And he, he had the same model effectively of interviewing big figures and then kind of selling courses and affiliate deals off the back of that. Business Accelerator course, um, Podcast Yourself course, paying about $3,000 for an eight-week course. Huge dissatisfaction. If you look on ScamGuard, there's like 30, 40 people saying this is a complete con. When COVID hit, he saw an opportunity. He got David Icke, the conspiracy theorist, David Icke on to, to talk about, and the interview, he said, COVID is a hoax. It's all caused by 5G. If we don't get off our knees, this is a fascist takeover. If we don't get over our, off our knees, humanity is over. In May 2020, so in the first wave of COVID, while in the UK, people were burning down 5G masts, and like engineers were being threatened. Like YouTube had, so YouTube took it down, of course, because it was, it was seriously putting people's lives at, at risk. Like that's kind of a bit of open and shut case. But then Rose went on the war path and said, ah, oh, censorship, censorship. I'm going to launch a digital freedom platform that's going to be independent of London Real. He launched it. It maxed out at over a million dollars, which he never expected. He, he initially set the total of, of 100,000. And then he just kept boosting it, boosting it, boosting it. You could just see the surprise and joy on his face. Ended up raising over a million for a digital freedom platform that didn't exist, was a plugin on his website, completely owned by him. So 
his whole audience turned on him. He became a kind of persona non grata on YouTube, and then he pivoted to standing for London mayor, and had a car crash, and had a car crash of a London mayoral campaign as a kind of promotional thing. And I, I found myself in the weird position of being the only journalist paying close attention to what he was up to, and so I covered it quite a bit on the channel. It got a lot of pickup. It was that—that that was the. That's probably the one time when I feel like I probably did maybe two or three stories too many on Brian Rose because it was getting lots of really good views and people were enjoying dunking on him. And But at the same time, I covered it because the, what was when he started the London Mayor run, the Times covered him, the Evening Standard covered him, and they, they covered none of the backstory. They just did a puff piece effectively, and I was like, this is insane. I knew journalism was bad. I didn't realize it was this bad. So I kind of made it a little bit. I, it, I, I followed the story quite a bit. Um, and it, he genuinely is the grift that keeps on giving. Like people were obsessed with him. There were, there were Reddit threads about him. There were Facebook groups about him. He, he, he makes Dave Rubin look self-effacing and, um, and, and, yeah, someone who kind of has... And, and makes Dave Rubin look like someone with, a, with an unusually high degree of self-knowledge, which is pretty unusual. So, um, It's funny. He, it's funny. He was, it's, astonishing. Because... It was, he was astonishing. Absolutely astonishing. Sorry. Yeah, no, it's fascinating just because, you know, anyone who has any kind of ambitious, significant growing project on the Internet always has some haters who love to use the word grifter, this or that or whatever. But when you actually look at things like the, the, the grifters have a way of really distinguishing them, themselves, you know, it's like you, there really are two different paths in this world. It's like there's the honorable, honest, transparent, value creating path where the overwhelming majority of people you work with and do things with are going to give you positive authentic reviews where they just genu genuinely say, I like this stuff. It's totally worth the money. That's all there is to it. And then there's like <laughs> the Brian Rose pathway where, you know, if, if you're actually a grifter, the grifting tends to compound because the only way, the only way to grow successfully, if you're at all a grifter, an actual grifter is to keep doubling down on the griftiness. Uh, and so it's like these, these divergent paths, which are kind of exponential in a way. So I always think it's funny when when uh, people use the word grifter loosely. It's like, no, when you actually look at, you know, the full range of different uh, creators and whatever you want to call them, uh, the, the, the grifts have a way of uh, truly distinguishing themselves. Yeah. And and you just got this sense with his trajectory that when you're in a hole, you just keep digging more. And he do things that you just your jaw would be on the floor. You'd be like, I can't believe he did that. Just one little example towards the end of his London mayoral campaign, he was interviewed by these kids, these sort of 15-year-old kids with a politics podcast who'd been watching all of my stuff. He was not expecting to have difficult questions from these kids. And they did an amazing job. They basically, they basically held him to account. They made him look like an idiot. He, he's a genius and an idiot at the same time. So what he did, he recorded his own end of the Zoom interview they did and prematurely uploaded it to YouTube and did a copyright claim so they couldn't upload their own interview to YouTube. So that on one level, it's like the, the kind of crafty genius of thinking of that and blocking their, blocking their own upload, thinking, oh, I'll, I'll, I'll just stop this interview because it was such a car crash going up. But then no thought about, like, how's that going to look? So that became a big, that was the main thing that cut through at the end of his campaign was that he'd censored kids. It's like you don't censor kids as a politician. That's just a so like this kind of gap between like short term thinking genius, long term thinking idiot. And it yeah, it, and he just do things like that that as a kind of connoisseur of the grift, it became such a beautiful, a beautiful thing to watch. It was it was a lot of fun actually covering that story. Yeah, it's fascinating, really fascinating. Thanks for uh, breaking that down for my audience who might may or may not have heard of the details. So. I don't want to keep you too much longer, but I'd like to learn a little bit more substantively about the, let's call it the core theoretical perspective of, of your operations at the moment, and specifically the sense-making course that is one of your current focuses. How would you characterize, you know, the rebel wisdom philosophy of sense-making? What, what does that mean exactly to you, and how would you summarize it? We've, we've used the... Um the kind of three-part epistemic model quite a bit. 
uh, Daniel Schmachtenberger. Are you familiar with Daniel? Sure, I don't know him personally, but I've, I've heard him a bit. Yeah, so Daniel, Daniel is a, a huge influence on a lot of our thinking, um, along with along with quite a other pe few other people. But he was talking about the three part epistemics, which is obviously kind of classic philosophical distinction. Um, so, for, and and we realised that we'd crafted the course around three part epistemics without really thinking about it. So it takes a journey from first person epistemics, becoming aware of our own biases, becoming aware of um, like how am, I, how am I in the moment, tools from mindfulness. We do kind of a little bit of breath work. We do sort of mindfulness meditations. Um, and then moving on to second person epistemics. So looking at how do I dialogue with other people? What's my, how are my relationships? How, assuming we can only make sense really together in combination and connection with other people. We practice, um, and John Viveki uh, has been a big influence on this side of things. He talks a lot about dialogos, which is a form of di like emergent dialogue. When you're having a conversation that genuinely goes into new areas, how does that happen? What, are, what is the sci scientific basis be behind that? There's these different modalities like circling, authentic relating. The one we use is called inquiry, and that comes from a specific kind of... Um, lineage back in the 60s, something called essence, diamond essence work. But it's, it's a kind of reinvention of the way John Bavaki frames it is that this is where uh, Greek philosophy came from. It was a process of exploration and, and, and a live inquiry into truth between people. And that's how the early kind of dialogues were, were written up. And so what is the nature of that exploration? What is the nature of that kind of, and how do you get yourself into a it's like a meditation between two people or between more than two people where you're trying to get yourself to the edge of your experience. Articulate something maybe you've never articulated before or to, to get yourself into a flow state together. So we do a lot of that. And then only after like a few weeks of the course do we move on to, okay, let's apply this, what we've just learned, to the information landscape. We give people a reverse media diet. So whatever you're used to reading for this next week, go and read the opposite. If you're used to CNN, go and, go and dive into Breitbart. If you're, if you're more on the right, go and, go, and watch Vo go and read Vox for a week. And so we ask, and, and be mindful, like how are, you being, how are you judging what you're reading? How are you being triggered by what you're reading? How are you rejecting what you're reading? And, and very much based on the kind of idea from in integral theory, something like Ken Wilber, where he says, each perspective is true but partial. So it's like, what are the truths in all of these different partial perspectives? And can we kind of elevate to a more meta level where we appreciate why the different sides or the different um, tribes think the way they do? Um, so that's kind of the overview. And then, um, yeah, it's, it's, we've, we've genuinely been blown away. Ali, Ali, my colleague, takes the lead on Sense Making 101, but we genuinely been blown away by how much can be achieved in that, like the, the journey that people go on and the amount of, um, yeah, the, the amount of shift that people say they find in their, their kind of way of looking at the world has been, yeah, genuinely kind of touching and, um, yeah, really, really moving. Like it, it, it sort of really feels like a kind of group process that people get a lot out of. Um, so, yeah, more than we ever expected. All right, fantastic. Thank you for that excellent summary. And I, I think my, my final question is just, I wonder if you have any advice for my audience, people who are thinking about their own path, whether it be in the institutions or charting some kind of independent path by defecting from the institutions. I have a lot of people like this in my audience who are in their own way, thinking about this kind of decision calculus for themselves. Maybe they, they kind of want to be a professor, but they're not sure if it's worth going into academia anymore. They kind of want to be a mainstream journalist uh, with a staff position at some journalistic outlet, but they're not sure if it's worth going down that path anymore, or should they start a YouTube channel or a podcast? This is something that a lot of people in my audience are are grappling with in one way or another. And just as someone who's charted this course, I'm curious if you have any general advice or, or heuristics that I maybe haven't asked you about yet that you want to leave my audience with. I mean, the one that really comes to mind is, uh, my sense... My sense is that the, the institutions are going to continue to, to leak a lot of um, 
the status that they have at the moment. And when I, I guess when I, when I think back to a lot of the people that I know in journalism, it's like you need to be the kind of person who has something interesting to say. And I don't think that I was that person up until I'd done quite a lot of personal growth work and it kind of really, really worked on myself. I, I think that's the crucial, I think that's the crucial piece is actually to, like, if you're, and this is kind of brutal and a little bit unfair, but if you're not that person, you're probably better off in an institution. If you are, if you aren't, if you are that person, you're probably better off out of the institution, as the whole Substack thing has shown. It's like, uh, I think that was the, the central belief of the people who created Substack was the star writers within a lot of these organizations are underpaid relative to what they're doing for the organization. And I think that thesis has been proved by effectively almost everyone who joined Substack would have, would have made more money if they'd, if they trusted that they would just get it through subscriptions rather because they, they, took a, they took a payment rather than the subscription and they realized they were undervalued by like half to, to two thirds. Um, that would be my, my big thing is like, I mean, for me, for me, almost everything comes down to personal growth on some level. But I, I think develop your skill, develop yourself, develop your, your abilities to, um, to offer something that no one else is offering. Develop, like, really kind of drill down on that particular piece of your, um, work out what is your particular piece to hold and, and have the confidence to really go for it. And find out what are the things that, what are the things that are stopping you doing that. Get some, get some help, get some support, get some kind of awareness, do some of these kind of processes, build up relationships with your friends where you can be really honest and get honest feedback from them and get into, into relationship with people who you, whose opinions you value. Get a mentoring relationship, get all of that stuff and because ultimately we're all going to stand and fall on the basis of the skills that, that we've got and the the ability that we have to show up with our unique gifts without wanting to get completely kind of new age about it, I think that's ultimately ultimately what we have to offer. And I don't think I would have, yeah, I don't, I know in my own trajectory that I tried a lot of other things similar to Rebel Wisdom before Rebel Wisdom started, before Rebel Wisdom was a success. And a lot of that, um, I have to give a lot of credit to my co-founder, Alexander Biner as well for the help and kind of we started it together and I, I, I leapt into the unknown more than once and failed and I think it only succeeded because I got the right relationships, I'd done enough of the kind of work of self-awareness to be, to be able to, to, to not fuck it up this time, I guess. Um, so that I, don't know if that, I don't know if that's useful, it's not, it doesn't, I don't know if that's practical enough for your audience. Yeah, that's fantastic. I think that's great advice. I think what you said at the beginning about having something real to say, having something real to share with the world is the hard part. I think you're absolutely right. And, and that is some somewhat hard for people to listen to because it means you have to go out and accomplish something. You have to, you have to pay your dues doing something. And I think that's a really, really good point. Yeah. You can't just like fire up a YouTube channel and make it grow into something significant if you don't have a real edge in sharing with the world something that is valuable and unique and that, that, that people want to learn more about or that is valuable in some way. And that is the hard part. And so I think you're absolutely right. And it's, it's worth reminding people of that. So yeah, and I, yeah I, guess, I just want to thank you for coming on, David. Wanted, oh, but please, yeah, you wanted yeah. to say something else? No, I just, I just, I guess I wanted to get the, the point over that if you feel that you don't, like, because this is the whole thing around the kind of incel dynamic, isn't it? That black pilled, it's like, well, some people have got it and some people don't. It's completely untrue. Like, I know I'm a completely different person than I was like 15 years ago when I when I started kind of, um, and and I think my message is, is is like anyone can anyone can if you don't feel that you've got that kind of thing yet you can find it. Like there is a particular thing that you have to offer, and there is a particular skill or or um, set of things that you have to share with the world. And I think yeah that that everyone maybe just needs to go on a journey to realize what that is if you if you don't feel that you're there yet right but the point is that you have to you have to pay your dues cultivating that and figuring that sure. out and putting in the work yeah, yeah. very totally. very jordan peterson 
<laughs> well, it's true for sure. I, I, I totally get it. Mm -hmm. So David, I just basically want to thank you for coming on. This was excellent. And I just, you know, want to say that I'm very impressed with what you and Alexander have built. You know, it's very, very hard to build a growing and financially successful operation on the internet and do it in a way that's really true to your character and where you're really, you know, seeking the truth in a way that is genuine and honest to you without, you know, descending into all of the kind of tasteless tendencies and tactics. And I think you've just done a really good job with that. I'm very impressed with the scale of what you've built and how you've done it. And also the, the quality that you put into your content. It's a really impressive operation and I'm grateful that you came on the show to let us look under the hood a little bit. Yeah. Thank you, Justin. All right. And for people watching or listening, there'll be links in the show notes to everything we talked about. If you want to go check out the Rebel Wisdom YouTube channel or the podcast or the courses that uh, David and Alexander are offering right now, there's a sense-making course going on actually probably right about the time that you're watching this or listening to this. So there'll be links in the show notes. All right, everyone. Thanks for listening. And I'll see you next time. Hey, thank you so much for listening to the podcast. You made it all the way to the very end, so you must really like the show. In that case, I would be super grateful if you'd be so kind to leave a review on Apple Podcasts. All you have to do is go to otherlife.co slash review. That's otherlife.co forward slash review. And it'll send you to Apple Podcasts. Just leave a review. You can be honest. Tell me what you really think. I'd really appreciate it because it'll help other people find the show, and I'm really trying to grow out the podcast. So thanks for listening, and thank you for leaving a review. I really appreciate it.